for a limited number of questions. We'll start with Adam. Thank you very much. Um, Katia Adler, BBC. Mr Barnier, um, during the transition period, if decisions are taken by the EU27, um, which are not acceptable to the United Kingdom, what action can the UK government take? You're talking about decisions pertaining to the single market or European policies. Or, 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 or the customs union, is that correct? I mean, any, any decision that's taken about the running of the European Union while the UK has observer status, what, you know... No, but if the Royaume-Uni... I tend to think very logically, very logically. So you've probably seen now how I've been working over the past year and a half. I've tried to keep things calm, objective and logical. So if the UK were to asks us to have this transition period, which is very important, obviously, for the UK, which gives it the time for the administrative pre pre preparations it needs before leaving definitively, so that all various players, stakeholders and so on can prepare for this. Uh, time is passing very, very quickly. Obviously, we also need time to prepare and we need time to negotiate on our future relations. The UK has asked us for this and our positive response at this time is we say that all of the acquis, the economic status quo, the European policies will be maintained between the 30th of March 2019 and the 31st of December of 2020. During that period, the decisions will apply, and the UK must acknowledge and accept these rules of the game from the outset. I mean, otherwise, uh, we'd be moving s towards something which we, we f did fear for the future, divergence and a type of uh, single market a la carte, which is not possible, certainly not during a transition period which the UK is requesting. Catherine Fiore, you reporter. Uh, I'd like to ask a question, firstly, to the minister. Uh, was there broad agreement on the the timing of the, the end period of this uh, transitional period? I mean... The Commission, the EU wants an orderly withdrawal. Will that be possible if the new the future relationship is not in place by the 1st of January 2021? And uh, I'd also like to ask the, the same question to Monsieur Barnier as well. I mean, do you, how can you ensure this orderly withdrawal if we're looking at just another cliff edge just further down the line? Thank you. Uh, maybe I first start. Mm. We are all interested in a smooth and orderly uh, withdrawal. And this is the aim of the negotiating team and of the member states, of the 27 member states. And I do believe that we have uh, joint interest here in this respect with the UK. What the transition period can give us is an opportunity for a smooth and orderly withdrawal and end of the relations. And as Michelle mentioned, we have a lot of work to do. And what we agreed upon during the Council earlier today was that the fixed date will be the date upon the decision of the December European Council, namely for a fixed specific cut-off date for the transition period. But the negotiation uh, directives and the declaration that was approved by the Council allow for flexibility, flexibility in terms of this period in case we didn't manage to achieve progress on the negotiations for the future. What is of interest to both parties is to have a fixed, a specific date and security of uh, the duration of the transition period. It cannot be an endless period. It is not to the UK's interest. Uh, 
Well, as you've just heard from the minister, it's in nobody's interest, certainly not in the UK's interests, to drag on, to extend that period of instability or uncertainty. We're working on an orderly withdrawal. There will be a, an agreement founded on the joint report. And all of that is intended to inject stability where the decision on Brexit, the decision to leave the EU, has created a lot of instability and uncertainty and uh, concern and worry for many citizens. So the more precise we are about this during these negotiations, the better it will be. Now, can we do everything? Well, we have to select priorities because there will be a short period of official negotiations. I think there are priorities. Uh, we have to look ahead to the idea of a free trade uh, agreement. There are other priorities such as home affairs, other areas of cooperation between the UK and the EU for defense and security, just to give a few examples. Now, from my experience of the way in which the Commission and the Parliament work, I'm convinced that we can work quickly and well in the course of this period. We're not starting these negotiations with a blank piece of paper. The UK is leaving the single market. So for trade negotiations, we wouldn't be in the same position exactly as, as countries who are very far away from us, not just geographically, but sometimes in, in regulatory terms, very different or far away from us. So it's a different thing. Now, I've talked about the level playing field which should last after uh, this all happens. We shouldn't have regulatory divergence becoming some means of, of dumping. That's very key to both us and to the British. So we have to say that when we start um, writing this agreement, we won't be starting with a blank piece of paper. We have something to go on. We have cooperation with uh, third countries in, in most areas. And we are screening various instruments, looking at foreign policy and defense in particular. So we will move very quickly, and we will try to implement those proposals as soon as possible. However, I would restate that we very much need the UK to clarify its positions. I'm at the back of the room here. I'm from the Spanish radio station, Radio Ser. Now, does it look right now that you're beginning to open the door and see the way for future relations with the UK? Has the UK formally stated or requested that these new relations begin to be created? Or is that something it has to do at a European Council? Do you need a formal request from the UK for the second phase of formal new relations? The reply to that first question is no, and to the second question it's yes. Okay, let me explain. No, we're not beginning the debate on future relations today with the UK, no. Today, I have received a mandate to begin negotiations on the transition period. That's not the same thing. Uh, and, and which does, to an extent, answer the previous question, because uh, the transition period, period is provided for in Article 50. Its only legal basis would be Article 50, and that's important, because it is a transition period. It is a specific element. It's not the future relations in any way. And if we wish to, I mean, we're also keeping an eye on the Court of Justice. If we want to maintain, if we look at the legal nature of Article 50 and the transition period, we've got to pay close attention to its duration. And that's something we need to pay close attention to in the light of any possible extension. But no, we are not, we, we are beginning the discussion on the transition period right now. And if, in March, if all goes well, the European Council, based on all the work we're doing right now, uh, and I didn't have the pleasure of meeting you in January, and uh, I know that some of you were a bit frustrated about this. Or not. <laughs> okay. During January, well, it's almost over now, but we did use this time to work 
very, very hard. We had quite a number of seminars among the 27 of us. We had meetings of the Brexit steering group in the parliament on quite a number of occasions on future relations and what's at stake. So we're working internally, collective ownership, if you like. We're having seminars every, every three days, bringing the 27 together with my team to look at the various angles. But when it comes to negotiating with the British and discussing these matters with the, with the British, that time will come after the European Council meeting, assuming that they by then have set out what they want. Time for one very short question. Thank you, Ian Wishart from Bloomberg. Um, David Davis has just been speaking in Parliament in London, and he said he now sees the deadline for a deal to be the end of the year rather than October. Do you still see October as being the, the preferred deadline? Um. We have to work on some high-quality uh, legal texts. If you talk about October, October, we're talking about an international agreement on an orderly withdrawal. I'll be very specific about this. This relates to two topics which are part of a single agreement. Everything to do with the separation, that's joint report plus all the topics that I mentioned. And in that same legal text, there will be an agreement on a transition period. Now, alongside that agreement, which will then be subject to ratification process, accompanying that will be a political declaration. And in the political declaration, we will set out all the possible ramifications of a future relationship. But it's a political declaration. It's not a treaty or a legal agreement, but a very precise political declaration of what the heads of state and government uh, wish. Now, it's not a, a matter of, uh, of weeks, but it's a matter of uh, making sure there's still time to ratify the withdrawal agreement because the UK said they want to leave on the 29th of March 2019 at midnight or 23 hours, 100 hours, if, if you're talking about Big Ben, 11 o'clock at night. But that's the request the UK have made. They want to leave then. So you have to count backwards to work out when the ratification uh, period has to start. Now, it may be quite speedy, but this is a major historic treaty, and it may take time for member state parliaments. It might take time for, for the British parliament, might it not? So I want to be sure we have that time, because we have to have that time period available. We can't go too close to the end, end of the year, you know, even if it's not a matter of being too fussy about a week or so. But we are working towards the end of October anyway. Oh, okay. That concludes today's press conference. I'm happy to be here. I'm quite happy to answer more. Stone from, from Sky News. Um, Mr Davis has also, uh, in the past few minutes, been, been uh, saying that, that there are various areas which remain under dispute as far as he is concerned. I, I wonder if you see these areas as under dispute. First of all, he is questioning whether the UK can negotiate free trade agreements during this transition period. Uh, yes or no. Secondly, he's asking... Uh, whether the UK can reject new laws um, that they haven't got a say on, uh, similar to what, what Katia was asking. Uh, and thirdly, can the UK have any representation in any committees within the European Union apparatus? Thank you, sir. Alors, nous avons... We've got replies to David Davis in the negotiating directives. I hope he'll be happy with those replies. Those are the replies of the union in any case. Those are mine in the negotiations. Yes, during the transition period, where the UK has wished to benefit from the economic status quo, it will be able to initiate discussions with third countries, clearly. It's a short period of time, and you've got to remember the day on which the UK leaves based on its decision on the morning of the 30th of March, it will leave 750 different international agreements behind. Legally, that's an automatic mechanism. Uh, that means that it will need to use all the time 
it has available to construct relations with third countries with which it will subsequently have to cooperate. So we understand that it may wish to use this, use this time for negotiations. However, no agreement with a third country committing the UK can be implemented during the transition period without the agreement of the 27 member states. Then you went on to say what kind of dialogue. Um, the, the UK has decided to leave the Union. That's its choice. It's not us who took this decision. It's them. So they are leaving the institutions. They're leaving the Council, the Parliament. There will no longer be any UK citizens as, as, as commissioners. That's, that's its choice, and that has consequences on the fact that uh, it will no longer, having, having left the institutions, it will no longer participate in the decision-making process. Nevertheless, and I'm speaking subject to the control of the presidency here, the, if decisions involve the UK or UK economic players, specific consultations will, of course, on an exceptional and case-by-case -case basis be provided for. And we have provided for such consultation process in some committees, or indeed directly with the UK. That's it now. I think, as Monsieur Bernier just said, uh, it is possible uh, if we decided uh, in the EU to invite uh, UK to participate in the future amendments in uh, the EU legislation, but only on invitation, and if it's agreed uh, exceptionally uh, from the EU member states. Thank you very much. Monsieur Bernier, are you still happy to be here? No, but I can still ask a question. I could take another question. Yeah, fine. Forever. Bruno. Maybe one more. Thank you. Very kind. I just wanted to ask about the, the, the annex uh, that was published with the negotiating uh, mandate uh, as well. So a council statement for the minutes and a commission statement um, for the minutes. And in the Council State for the minutes, it says for security, defence and foreign policy um, arrangements can be agreed in transition period. Is that you, Mr Barnier, who does that, or is that a Council negotiation? Uh, it also says that the Council will follow negotiations uh, closely and keep these directives under review. Is, is that in terms of the uh, date, the 31st of December 2020? Um, it also... Uh, talks about the procedures to authorise international agreements in the transition um, that Mr Barnier referred to just now. Is that replication of these 70 trade agreements that the UK can, if it replicates those agreements, can come and get that um, authorised? And you, in the Commission statement, it says you'll be providing a guidance document on these case-by-case -case, uh, scenarios where Britain can be an observer um, at decisions. Will you, how detailed will that be? Will you go through the whole area of decisions such as in the banking, uh, 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 banking supervisory bodies, macro prudential decisions, all that kind of stuff? How detailed will that guidance be? Thank you. Je me demandais où vous vouliez en venir. I was wondering where you're going to end up there. That was a very long question. Well, you ended up Plunk onto the financial services sector. Okay, that's where you ended up. Well, we're going to clarify those issues. There will be a number of areas which will be under supervision of, of council, and we will work out what the framework for these consultations will be. But they will be limited, exceptional, and on a case-by-case -case basis, because it is the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the EU and its institutions and bodies. We will find a practical way of dealing with this. But I haven't heard anybody talk about observer status, to use the words that you used there. That's not what it will be. The UK is leaving the EU's institutions. The UK is asking to keep the economic status quo for all the reasons which are of interest to it and maybe of use to us as well. So we will uh, make provision for this transition period. But the most interesting thing in this whole negotiation, beyond the, the separation process and the transition uh, process is that we should be working on the future and a new partnership with the United Kingdom, and this in the general interest. 
And we will have to take account of uh, the red lines, its red lines, the issues which the UK will need to clarify, and taking account of what we are and what we are and what we're not prepared to negotiate on. We're not going to negotiate on the integrity of the single market. We're not going to negotiate on the autonomy of decision-making for the 27 member states. We're not going to negotiate on the indivisible nature of the four freedoms. Now, if that's been well understood, and I hope it's been well understood, well then, in all the areas, including the areas that you mentioned there, well, in that case, then we can work on an ambitious partnership with the United Kingdom. It could be free trade agreement, uh, cooperation on home affairs, cooperation on research with universities, Erasmus programs. But there will be different rules from the ones we have today, financially and legally speaking. And of course, as many member states want, and I certainly wish uh, to see, we will, should have uh, some form of bilateral cooperation on defense and security. However, we have to respect what we are and what we stand for. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Conference, thank you very much for your participation.